Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to share our research. Um, and my lab studies uh, mechanics of cells and subcellular structures. Um, and I want to start with um, echoing something um, Tine was referring to, which is um, the cell membrane really is amazing, which might not be obvious from the title of my talk. Um, um, first of all, um, you know, particularly for us, um, we have been fascinated by um, the this bilayer of lipids from the perspective of treating it as a two-dimensional material, um, which have unique mechanical properties. Um, additionally, um, this um, cell membrane or lipid membrane is extremely dynamic. So here you see the surface of the cell um, having this finger-like protrusions or phyllopodia forming uh, and collapsing all the time. Um, and this poking and sort of pushing forces in the cell can create a mechanical tension in the cell membrane. Um, and among many different things, membrane tension um, can gate the activation of a family of ion channels, such as piezo channels as shown here. Um, so um, a few years ago, we um, found that the tension in the cell membrane is actually extremely localized. What this means for mechanical sensing or mechanical sensitive ion channels is um, the activation of um, these ion channels are really localized to where the force is applied. Here we demonstrate this, this idea by pull, locally pulling on the cell membrane and observing where does um, you know, piezo one gets activated through calcium imaging. Here, what you see is the the influx of calcium through piezo one starts at the location where you are pulling the membrane. Um, and this is um, this what this means is it's, it's important for membrane mechanical tension or membrane tension to be um, equilibrating slowly so that a local high tension can build up to uh, open or gate this uh, important ion channels. Um, so, um, but this tells us, um, you know, this gives us new insights towards how to think about the activity of individual channels, but every single piezo one at best represent a single pixel on this picture of a single cell. Um, so when um, in, more recently, uh, we got interested in a different question, which is, if you have thousands of these piezo channels, how do they actually distribute within the plasma membrane of one cell? Um, without going into any details, what we saw was the shape or the curvature of the cell membrane actually play an important role. Um, and we, we, can, we can show that um, the density of piezo one um, increases as the radius of a membrane protrusion increase. In other words, there's a curvature dependent sorting of piezo one on the cell surface. A direct consequence of this is all these highly curved thin protrusions from the cell surface, they are depleted from piezo one because of the curvature mismatch. Um, and, um, and it's a little bit more interesting because um, piezo one, as I said, is an ion channel, meaning it can be activated. And turns out the activation of the protein leads to a partial sort of uh, rescue of this depletion of piezo one from membrane protrusions. In other words, resting piezo channels stay away from phyllopodia, but if you add an activator or if you stretch the channel, um, you might be able to have a higher population of the ion channel on um, membrane protrusions. So, you know, with that, we, with that we, we are getting a better idea of the mechanical properties of the cell surface and how these mechanical signals can be regulated or transmitted um, into the cell. And now if you open a cell, um, there are many organelles which are also have, which are extremely complex, but um, they also have a membrane boundary. Um, so to some level, um, we know how they will respond mechanically. Um, but as many of you know, probably know, um, in the past 10 to 15 years, there's an increasing realization that um, inside the cell, there are many organelles which doesn't have a membrane boundary. These are so-called so membrane-less organelles or condenses, which are essentially droplets of proteins, sometimes with RNAs, that can emerge through liquid-liquid state separation. So now this um, condenses pose a new challenge for us, right? Because the question now becomes, what are the key 
mechanical or material properties of this condensate that can determine their mechanical response. Um, so for any um, liquid or um, liquid condensate, um, really there are two um, key things you need to think about when thinking about them in terms of in, you know, in terms of a material. The first thing is if you imagine your molecule inside the condensate, um, every conformational change or every reaction with other molecules in the environment will involve um, some level of viscous motion. So you have to um, worry about how viscous it is inside the condensate. Um, additionally, there has been this interesting uh, hypothesis which which says um, for many neuronal proteins, um, a transition from a liquid state to a solid aggregation state might be the reason that um, underlies their disease mechanism. Um, so the first thing we, you need to worry about from a material perspective is the viscosity or viscoelasticity of the condensate. Now, if you move beyond the condensate, inside the cell, it's extremely crowded. Um, so your condensate will have to interact with other condensates, with other polymers in the cell, such as cell, cell skeletons and um, DNAs, RNAs, um, or it may even interact with membranes. Um, so in here, um, all these interactions, um, including wetting behavior or miscibility between different condenses, are essentially, at least at steady state, determined by the interfacial tension of these condenses. So in other words, um, for liquid condensate, you need to worry about two things, viscosity and interfacial tension or surface tension. But tools to measure these two properties are quite limited um, in the literature. Uh, most of um, viscosity measurements rely on tracking of uh, the diffusion of a tracer particle or molecule, um, where you have to um, be aware of uh, certain important assumptions. Um, but the bigger problem really lies in the measurement of surface tension or interfacial tension of condenses, because um, you know if you look in the literature, um, ninety percent of what we know about the interfacial tension of condenses rely on this measurement of um, condensate fusion, um, where the idea is if the surface tension is high, the condensate will fuse faster, but at the same time, the process is slowed down by a high increase of viscosity of condenses. You know, we can, uh, in the lab, we can use optical traps to for make this measurement high throughput. You can measure tens of experiments in a couple of minutes. But uh, intrinsically, this is a limited asset because it only tells you a ratio of two independent uh, material properties. So a few years ago, when we reviewed the literature, we thought um, it seems like there's clearly a need for direct measurements of surface tension or ideally also viscosity. Um, and it would be nice to be able to do these measurements in living systems. Um, so at the time, I was um, teaching a class um, called general chemistry for um, freshman um, chemistry students. Um, and the first chapter um, we cover have a section called capillary action. Um, it, it describes how you know doctors can use a thin glass tube to help draw blood from the fingertip of patient. And there needs to be a slight translation of the language here. You know, in the textbook, it talks about cohesive forces between molecules. That's the reason why this capillary action happens. But in physics, what this really means is um, there is um, a bulk surface tension of the liquid, which is driving the process. In other words, um, this capillary effect is a direct and simple measure of surface tension of liquids. Um, um, Indeed, you know, if you want to measure the surface tension of this beaker of liquid, all you have to do really is to put to put a thin glass tube inside the liquid, and the surface tension will pull the liquid upwards until it's balanced by the gravity of this liquid column, and then you can just look at the mechanical equilibrium um, by measuring how high the liquid rises. You can calculate. Um, surface tension in you know, a simpl simplified experiment shown over here. Um, the only problem really is um, here it requires a, you know, a beaker of liquid, whereas a single condensate is about a billion times too small. So, um, but in the lab, we have a tool called micropipettes, which um, is a smaller version of this capillary where the 
where you have a glass tube with opening around a couple of micrometers. And you know, looking at this picture, you may already conclude this is you know, perfect for directly probing condenses of a few microns in size. Um, and um, now we can measure the mechanical equilibrium of a condensate in this pipette. We can measure surface tension, um, but it gets better because um, we can also control the pressure inside the pipette. So we can tip the system off equilibrium and look at how quickly this condensate flows under different pressure. Now you have a linear relation between the pressure you apply in your pipette versus how quickly the liquid flows uh, is resembled by S. Um, and the slope of this line tells you the viscosity of the liquid and the intercept at you know, zero flow tells you the interfacial tension of your condensate. And here's how it works in real life. Um, this, this is the drop of 13 um, condens a, a condensate made of LAF1 RGG domains. Um, towards the upper left, there's a glass capillary. You cannot really see very well, but we're controlling the pressure in the, in the micro pipette. Um, and you are seeing the condensate flowing in and out and flows faster and slower as you increase or decrease the pressure in your pipette. Eventually you get a relation between the pressure you apply versus how quickly um, your condensate flows. And again, the, the slope of this line tells you viscosity and the, the intercept of this line tells you interfacial tension. So you get two independent measurements from one experiment. Um, and the last thing I want to emphasize here is um, this micropipette technique is intrinsically a label-free technique, meaning you, know, you can measure condensate under a fluorescent microscope um, by labeling your protein, but you can also do this in a typical bright field microscope, right? There doesn't have to be any label. Um, so what this means is it, it really gives us an opportunity to address any um, concerns or par paranoids about the, the possibility of fluorescent labeling changing the properties of condenses. So we have some interesting uh, findings recently. Um, I'll happy to sh share this in the near future. Um, but for now, um, the main message here is we have a technique we can, which allows us to map the surface tension and viscosity of um, a wide variety of condenses. Um, here, um, this is what we got for this last one, RGG uh, condensates. And more recently, we have been focusing on a protein called synapsin um, in collaboration with um, Dragoslav, um, which is um, synapsin is a um, extremely abundant protein um, in the presynaptic terminal of neurons. It's form condensates, and one of the function of the condensates is to regulate the clustering of synaptic vesicles in the neuron. Um, as you can imagine, the material property of the condensate will be important for things like neuron transmitter release and um, neuronal com communication. Um, and the phase separation of synapsin is driven by its C-terminal IDR. So what we saw was, um, but if you remove the end terminus, um, you also, you know, it still form condensates, but the condensates have a much lower viscosity. Um, we also investigated, um, we also found several different factors that can increase the viscosity of synapsin condenses. What's interesting here is um, these three different factors, synaptic vesicles, arvacinuclein, and PEG, which is a crowding reagent, they all increase viscosity, but they have distinct effects on the interfacial tension of the synapsin condenses. Further highlighting these are two independent properties that you have to uh, worry about. Um, you know, independently. Um, and um, also empirically, um, factors that we, that typically promote or enhance phase separation are the factors that also increase the viscosity of your condensate, but their effect on surface tension is much less intuitive, at least based on this example. Um, we are particularly for interested or intrigued by this effect of arvacinuclein because as um, you might know, um, arvacinuclein is a major component of something called Lewy body, which is a marker for um, Parkinson's disease and several other dementia. Um, and the fact the presence of arvacinuclein increase the viscosity, you know, meaning potentially triggering a liquid to solid transition is intriguing. Um, if, and um, indeed, arvacinuclein really represents a large family of 
a neuronal proteins which can um, phase separate from condenses and also aggregate, where their aggregation can cause um, degeneration of neurons. Another one of these example is called tau protein, where um, um, is um, known to be a, to be highly involved in Alzheimer's disease. Um, we were able, in collaboration with Jim Bond's lab, we were able to um, purify tau and measure is the material properties of tau condenses. And interestingly, um, tau condenses both, um, especially in in disease conditions, are often co-localized with um, inclusion of alpha synuclein. And indeed, when we put alpha synuclein into tau condenses, we see this nice enrichment of synuclein into this condenses of tau. But to our surprise, um, the highly enriched synuclein to tau condenses barely change the viscosity of the condensate. This is very different from what you saw just a couple minutes ago about how the same synuclein can dramatically increase the viscosity of synapsing condenses. So you know, it just tells you how different condenses are can be very different molecularly. Um, and um, we also did an additional experiment where we looked at something called um, seeds of alpha synuclein, which is uh, essentially, um, small versions of fibers formed by alpha synuclein, and here you see um, the seeds enriched to the condensate, but um, there is a much, you know, in contrast to this monomer of synuclein, the seeds have now have a much bigger effect on their uh, viscosity. Um, in fact, if you measure the viscosity of Synuclein seed containing tau condenses, you can see an increase of viscosity basically every minute um, during our experiment. So there is a there is a strong sort of aging like effect. We're hoping that these measurements can, um, you know, give us some insights in the mechanism of why this tau and synuclein proteins might be causing diseases in the future. Um, but at the same time, um, I think many of you probably will agree with me that. Um, Systems like this um, with in reconstituted condenses in vitro, um, they are very helpful to dissect um, the molecular details, but it's far from the complicated environment of a living system. So um, to move forward, um, one of the focus in the lab is really to push, um, to try to measure these condenses, uh, material properties of condenses in living cells. And this is really what I think this micropipette-based technique really shines comparing to other techniques because um, micropipettes has been used in neuroscience for decades under a different name called patch clef. Um, so that basic idea is um, you can have a cell, um, you can use your micropipette, a thin glass capillary to break into um, poke a hole on the cell surface. If you do it um, gently, um, the platform will plasma membrane will seal to the edge of the pipette, leaving a hole open for you to um, probe the electrical environment inside the cell. But in our case, we're hoping to combine this with a uh, mechanical or pressure control uh, where we can you know, use this pressure uh, controlling ability to measure the mechanical uh, material properties of condenses nearby this um, hash pipette. Um, and long story short, um, it worked after uh, a lot of efforts um, by, uh, led by Juan, a graduate student in the lab, um, and we're now re renaming the technique MAPAC. And here is how it works. Um, so again, this is a hex cell, um, sorry, this is a hex cell again with uh, synapsin and synuclein condenses. Um, and um, here we're using a pipette towards the upper direction. Uh, we're breaking into a cell. Once you break in, you can measure the voltage of the membrane. And um, once the condensate gets to the pipette, um, you can begin to apply pressure steps and watch how does the condensate deform um, in the pipette. And when your mechanical perturbation is too strong, the cell dies and you, you, you will see the voltage of the membrane goes back to zero. Um, the first thing we saw was um, there is an interesting electrical signal at the moment when the condensate goes to the pipette tip. Um, we are still exploring this, um, but for the purpose of today's talk, um, the most important message here really is now we are able to apply a controlled pressure inside the cell, and we're able to watch the deformation of the condensate. And these two things allows us to 
basically measure or quantify the mechanical properties of the condensates in this living cell. Um, and of course, we can do this in a more uh, systematic way. Here we are applying pressure steps um, in an increasing fashion. Um, we are watching the deformation of this condensate accordingly. Um, what you see here is, um, here is a zoom in of one of these steps. When you apply your pressure step, there is a flow of the condensate into the pipette, just as you expect for a liquid. But at the same time, um, there is also a reversible elastic deformation, meaning now the condensate is not just a pure liquid anymore within our measurement. There is significant elastic or solid-like properties. Um, we can use these two features to measure the change of flow rate B as the function of pressure to get viscosity, or to measure the this elastic deformation as a function of pressure to get elasticity. Um, and um, the first thing we realized is there's a lot of variations between cells. Here are just three sort of representative examples where um, in the black line, you see a quick flow of the condensate um, under pressure, a short pulse of pressure. Um, and in the blue line, what you see is the condensate deforms um, reversibly, but there's no measurable flow um, in, the measure, in the process. Um, and the red case is somewhere in between, right? It's both flows uh, also have this reversible um, elastic deformation. Um, when Juan measured this for hundreds of cells, um, what she saw was there is a, a huge amount of variation between the viscoelasticity of condensates from different cells, although all the cells express the same proteins. Um, the, there's you know, the variation in viscosity is more than 10,000 fold. Um, and um, perhaps more importantly, there is um, the viscoelasticity we measure here is much higher um, than what we got for in vitro condensates. This is something we'll go back into in a couple of minutes. But at this point, you may wonder, you know, if you measure a physical property that changed by 10,000 fold, what are you going to learn from this measurement, right? Um, so to answer that, I'd like to invite you to look at these four pictures I have on this slide closely. Um, so there are four pictures of four cells with four different uh, synapsing condenses as um, represented by this um, right circle. And the line represents a uh, intensity profile across the condensate. Um, I just to ask you to predict which one of these four condensate is more liquid-like and which one is more solid-like. You know, feel free to put your guess or prediction in the chart. Um, but I have done this a few times. Um, what I got was about 25% of people will guess the right answer. Um, in other words, um, you know, most people are just guessing. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, Juan was able to actually measure this um, with uh, her um, micropipes. And um, she was actually arranging the data in a way that the pressure she applied to this four condensates increased from one to four. But what you see is the mechanical response actually decreased. In other words, it's becoming more you know, it's becoming harder and harder to deform the condensate going from condensate one to condensate four. When I first saw this, I thought, uh, well, you know, it just nicely shows that you cannot really predict rheology of something based on one picture. Um, but it turns out there's something more to this because um, remember these condensates of the cells have a co-expression of a second protein called arosinuclein. Now, if you look at the channel of arosinuclein, you see this nice correlation where cells which are more um, less fluid-like have a much higher amount of nuclein or ha much higher affinity towards nuclein, whereas cells which behave more like a liquid barely have any enrichment of nuclein into the condensate. Um, in other words, um, can you predict condensate liquidity from a picture? Yes, you can, if you choose the right channel or right marker to look at. Um, and it's not always obvious. In this case, it's for alpha nuclein, but it's not obvious which is the right marker before doing the measurement. Um, and I want to highlight that you know there's nice correlation between viscosity of the condensate versus the partitioning of alpha nuclein, and the the condensates which have the highest viscoelasticity, you know, at least re rheologically, really you know resembles this disease causing Lewy bodies, which are made of nuclein and several other proteins. Um, okay, so 
the last point I want to sort of circle back to is um we you know measured the same what we thought is the same condenses in both in living cells as well as in vitro. Um in cells we see this correlation between um viscosity condensate versus the partition of the nuclein. Um and we saw this, you know, we can reconstitute the both proteins in vitro with purified synapsin and alpha synuclein. Um, and we can measure how does the viscosity change with our synuclein, right? Um, again, we see an increase of viscosity as a function of synuclein concentration. If what's surprising to us was when we measure the partitioning of synuclein into this synapsin condenses, the amount of partitioning basically saturates after 2.5. So we never really get as high as 10 or to 100. In other words, if you plot this in vitro data together with the cell measurements, they follow the same trend, meaning the viscosity increase as a function of uh, synuclein partitioning, but you never really get to explore all these um, high partitioning conditions with in vitro reconstitution. What this tells us is there must be other factors in the cell which might be helping the synapsin condenses to re recruit our synuclein molecules, and this is something we hope to study in the near future. Um, so the so last point, I don't know if I still have time. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, this micropipette is a direct, you know, allows a direct opening on the cell surface to probe condenses. Um, you know, at the same time, if you finish your measurements, you may as well just um, ask for the entire condensate, right? Um, so what this means is, you know, here are the few examples where we can um, sort of apply a strong pressure where, where we really uh, sort of isolate individual condenses into the pipette tip. Um, and so the idea we really hope to explore in the future is, you know, you can look at this deformation process, you can measure the material properties. Um, after your material quantification, you can also isolate every single condensate. Now you have this opportunity to really, um, you know, study the compositional complexity of intact condenses in living cells. And you can, for example, you can do RNA sequencing or even um, potential proteomics measurements um, with the, you know, concern, potential concern that every single condensate is about one nanogram. So you do need really sensitive measurements, but I think now there's there's this opportunity to begin thinking about such type of sort of correlated mechanical and compositional measurements of condensates. All right, with that, I want to just quickly summarize summarize this talk. Um, so first of all, there are two important material properties of for condensates: viscoelasticity and interfacial tension. And uh, often these two properties are regulated by distinct factors, and they can be very different for different proteins, as we demonstrated for synapsin versus tau. Um, and secondly, we develop a new technique called MAPAC, which really allows us to directly quantify condenses in living cells. And what we found was, um, in the case of synapsin condenses, the partition in our synuclein um, leads to um, 10,000 fold variations in the viscoelasticity of these condenses. And this um, have a feature that cannot be captured by in vitro measurements. And lastly, I think um, there's an opportunity for um, coupling this MA pack measurements to uh, electrochemical or compositional analysis in the near future. So with that, I want to thank my collaborators, many of which I mentioned during the talk, as well as my um, students, most of the condensate uh, measurements are led by a senior graduate student, Wang Wang, uh, over here. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have.